A very good evening to all of you joining us live from Sri Lanka and around the world. Uh, let me welcome all of you very warmly to the spotlight this evening. Uh, and today we have with us a very special guest who has flown into our beautiful country. Uh, so without any further delay, let me welcome on board Mr. Corey Gray. Um, he is the global CEO of Smart Cities uh, and the council, the world's largest and longest running Smart Cities social impact organization and he is also the founder and director of global technology solutions provider LVX Global so he is a member also of various global industry groups including the Smart Cities Council, Smart Cities Council Europe, Australian Smart Communities Association, Institute of Public Works Engineers uh, Australasia and LMI a Technology Industry a Group based in Silicon Valley where he serves as a director and treasurer. He is highly regarded internationally for his expertise in thought leadership, policy and advocacy. Uh, so let me welcome you warmly to our studio. Uh, today and it is great to have you on board with us. It's good to be... How are you doing today? Um, a little bit tired but it's good to be back in Sri Lanka finally after a few years. Awesome. So let me get right into this. Uh, so you are all things smart. Uh, smart... Uh, it's not what my children tell me. <laughs> so it's, it's in a good way actually because it's taking our country and the world to a better, better place and to the next step as well. So why don't you introduce us? What is this concept of smart uh, innovation, smart tech, smart, smart cities? Or what, what is all of that about? It, it's a really good first question. Um, so I've, I've been involved in this, let's call it emerging industry sector for about 14 years. And at the end of the day, what we're really doing is just trying to do what we've always wanted to do for citizens. We want to make a safer place to live. We want to make it a more enabled world. We want a more beautiful world, a more sustainable, resilient and equitable world. Yeah. What Smart Cities really is, is how do we use the most current tools at our disposal with data and technology mm. to do a better job under more difficult circumstances than we've ever faced before. We have a planet at the limit of its resources. Um, we have an incredibly complex um, society, a geopolitical situation um, and you know this this tool that I'm on at the moment um, you know when I go from Melbourne Australia to Los Angeles in a day to London in a day to Dublin to Istanbul to Doha to Sri Lanka to Maldives you get a real sense of what the world is yeah. when you do that very quickly so part of what we're trying to do at the moment to come back to your question is take the the stigma out of smart and cities and firstly talk more about communities because mm. if you look at, at Sri Lanka more people live in rural communities in the population than in in cities right so sm smart cities shouldn't be elitist it should be for everybody for it's about and so for us there's a strong mission on democratizing data knowledge expertise political will finance um, in Australia and America, we're talking about projects, for example, for remote indigenous communities. Okay. Um, in the middle of Australia, as you would know, our First Nations um, people have, have lived for 65,000 years continuously yes. and they have an incredible relationship between people and place and spirituality and culture. So, so the first thing that you know, I would like to say to people who are asking what Smart Cities is, is it's really about making a better life for you. Um, the smart thing is still the people who do the thinking and sometimes there's technology to help. Sometimes it could be changing some legislation or the road rules or different ways to engage. So, um, but our, our mission is very clearly on creating a better outcome for people in okay. place and not just talking and blogging, but impact and action at a global and local level. So let me ask you, what are the characteristics that uh, we see uh, between a smart city and a traditional city? Uh, there's a strong argument there aren't too many smart cities yet, which is okay. why there's a, there's a strong movement. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've seen all through history, if you pick really disruptive technologies, what, let's say nuclear power, right? Yeah. Oppenheimer creates nuclear energy, a bomb goes off, it takes 23 years till we have a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. 
Yeah. We map the human genome and then we can clone our children, but then we decide what should we do versus what can we do. And yes. I think now with technology, particularly with machine learning and artificial intelligence, with chat GPT becoming so popular and people becoming so aware so quickly, sure. there is a fear. And part of the role of our organisation is to create a really strong ethical framework mm -hmm. around the use of very powerful transformational tools and technologies and make sure that the citizens are in fact benefiting and not becoming victims of big corporations or, or badly thought legislation. And in all of those things I mentioned before, governments typically lag the private sector in catching up with legislation around what is appropriate and what is right and what is fair. We saw a long discussion about even the understanding that people owned their personal data for a while. Um, mm. When the internet came in, the idea of internet stalking and all of these things, yeah. entire new legislation needed to be written. What jurisdiction? Is it happening in America, the crime? Is it in Sri Lanka? Is it in Germany? So there's a lot of discussion and, and it's why as an organisation, for us it's very important to have government, private sector, academia, charity and philanthropy all in the room together thinking about these things, not working separately to maybe different, different um, with different objectives. So how do you think uh, the public or the citizens, what do you think their role is when it comes to smart cities? What is the role you expect from them? How do you expect them to participate in this? I think citizens participate through their democratic process. They elect governments that they want to represent their best interests. So there's a role to be played um, in community awareness. I mean, most citizens don't get up every day and check what has changed in the legislation of their country. Definitely. So um, that would be a very unusual world if people did that. But yeah. there are significant changes that happen. Um, as an organisation, we think about a, a triangle, not a Maslow's hierarchy but at the top we need to be working with government to understand new opportunities, new challenges, create legislation, policy, advocacy. At the bottom create community awareness and not overcomplicate technology. I think one of the amazing things with a mobile phone is you know a two-year-old, it's a good and a bad thing again, yeah. a two-year-old can pick it up and work out intuitively how to use it but it's an incredibly complex device. So we need to be able to speak at all levels and in the middle of that, that, that triangle or pyramid is be creating respons responsible action and self-sustaining positive impact for people. Welcome back to the Spotlight. Now today we are in a very interesting conversation with Mr. Corey Gray that is founder and director of Global Technology Solutions Provider LVX Global. Uh, we were in the middle of a very interesting uh, topic that is smart cities. Uh, so before we get into our next question let me once again thank you for joining us uh, on this special program. Uh, continuing with our topic on smart cities, an area of interest for people you know, if we tread into this path, if and when we tread into this path, is the concern of security of personal data, privacy, cyber security. Do you mind speaking to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's about the biggest risk we face with this technology. The, the great value of what we've been able to do, of putting large amounts of data into one place to be able to analyse it, to learn, to get causal, reliable, actionable data, um, the opportunity there is profound, but the risk is extreme also. Um, the example I use often though is it's as citizens we decide to share risk collectively. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, when we go on the road it's, and drive a car, it's the most yeah. dangerous thing a person can do, right? And in Australia, my country, every day 10 people die, but as citizens we think the benefit outweighs the risk. We've got an insurance and a risk framework that everybody opts into as a citizen who gets a driver's license. We set the highest standards we can about the quality of the cars, the quality of the roads, we set road rules and you can't drink drive and you can't drive. So we do what we can to mitigate the risk but ultimately people accept it and I think if you look at the the proliferation of social media for example, people have decided that whilst there are issues of privacy and whilst governments have improved I think tremendously in 
Europe we've got GDPR regulations now about privacy. Any camera that films you must redact your face for in a public place and America's moving strongly in that direction. Definitely there needs to be a proper discussion with the public about what, what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable in terms of the, the security and privacy of their personal data. And unsurprisingly what we've seen in the proliferation of um, the technology age is also the proliferation of, of cybercrime, um, ransomware, malware, um, people's in my country, I think one telco leaked 12 million people's private data recently, right? Yeah. This is a big problem and we need to be aware of it. A lot of people don't know where to start with it, even at, you know, I'm on several boards of public companies and, and a charity in, in New York where we're high risk targets for people who want to steal personal data from donors to charities and, and so on. So we need to be very aware of those risks as a community, we need to discuss them as governments, we need to regulate and mitigate them appropriately. But there's great potential uh, good to be done as well and that's that's why um, we're finding ourselves in the places that we are because there are genuinely transformational things. If you look at, I mentioned earlier, um, DNA mapping, okay. we can find criminals now that we could never yeah. find, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, you could clone your child. So. Yeah. So we've got to decide what we can do and what we should do as a community and, and act on that. That's right. Now moving on to my next question for you. When we embrace uh, the concept of smart cities, what are the benefits that come along with it in terms of job creation, um, you know, revenue and things like that? I think every business case you ever build, you're trying to generate positive economic activity, you're trying to reduce cost, you're trying to reduce risk, and you're trying to deliver ESG or CSR benefits, better outcomes for workers, citizens, the environment. Mm. These are the objectives of any supportable business case. So um, this isn't the case of saying, I've got a great big shiny piece of technology and someone should pay a lot of money for it. Mm. I think one of the reasons that citizens initially have lost a little confidence in the quote unquote smart city movement is that they saw huge expenditure. The example I use is if you go out and build a spaceship yeah. but you have no astronauts, you don't get much benefit for that, right? Yeah. Which comes to your point of uh, economic activity. There are a lot of future industry jobs that need to be created now to support the infrastructures and technologies that we're delivering and equally there are jobs that we won't need anymore if we have automated parking inspection, for example, or driverless lawn mowers or driverless cars or planes, then... No, I think there are driverless cars. I think Tesla has... Yeah, also. they were nearly crashing into me the other day in Santa mm -hmm. Monica. All right. But that was probably my fault. But, but again, you've got to create a very complex legislative framework. That car yeah. crashes into somebody, Yeah. who's liable? Is it the car owner, the car operator, the data manager, the network operator? the LiDAR person, the local city, county, state, country. It's very complicated. Yeah. So the, the, in a lot of cases, the tech's there and the use cases and benefits are known, but that risk and regulatory framework isn't clarified. So there's a lot of discussion to be had in those areas and there are a lot of jobs that need to be created and this comes to what I personally see as a a great opportunity for Sri Lanka having come here many many times you have a very educated population um, very skilled population and there's a chance to scale in the technology sector and take significant economic steps forward which you're on the cusp of at the moment to be away from being beholden to tourism and if there's COVID tourism industry disappears if there's a terrorist attack tourist in industry yeah. disappears right disappears or the agricultural uh, industry with tea and rice and so on, it's a chance to scale at a, at, a, at a pace. You have, as I said, the right type of education, the right levels of education, you're in the right um, geography to service all of Asia. I see it as a huge opportunity for the people of Sri Lanka, many of whom are in, in Australia, that ultimately in time they can come back here and work in a really prosperous technology driven economy. Are there any countries at present that are, you know, experimenting with the concept of smart cities uh, that you know of? 
every single city I've been to in the last week have said that they're the smartest city okay. on earth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone's experimenting, but it means different things to different people. people. Um, so in one city it might be we've put in efficient energy management. In another city it might be smart lighting. In another city it might be waste management. In another city it might be cameras. But at, at scale there's been a huge challenge of adoption and uh, I think that there's a few reasons for that. One is these projects are very long and very complex and the way that cities organise themselves at the moment is not conducive. Uh, one, in one case before I was with Smart City Council I was advising a city as a consultant there were 23 different government verticals that had a part ownership of a project. Okay. So as, as you'd know, governments silo themselves typically and mm. suddenly you have Smart City that's a horizontal that goes through all of that. Mm. So one meeting took a whole day to work out whose name from the government from the city would be on the project as the project right. owner. But then who pays for it? Some of it's lighting, some of it's parking, some of it's water, some of it's security, some of it's data. Who pays for it? And then do you pay for it with capital? Do you pay for it with operational money? Do you borrow money? Who do you borrow it from? How do you pay it back? So there's an organisational challenge with smart cities. Um, again, the technology is all there. There's a procurement challenge, there's a funding challenge. And again, that's as an organisation, something that we're really trying to deal with every day is what does the future organisational structure of a city or a government look like? So, Corey, let me get into another question. You have visited Sri Lanka, you know how the country works. If we go into the field of smart cities, do you think we as a country, do you think we will be able to sustain that concept? Yes, I think any country can. The, the benefits are so significant for citizens, if it's done right, that you can get that community buy-in. As I said, you know, people want to be safer. Yeah. People want to live in a beautiful city, not yeah. an ugly city. People believe, for the most part, except for a few people in Texas, that you know that the environment is in crisis yeah. uh, and want to do something about that for their children in the future. And people want to live, again, for the most part, in inequitable environments. So the discussion and the narrative needs to go away from the technology and the data to the citizen benefit in my view. This is about the people and the places where they live and uh, there's a huge opportunity um, in, in Sri Lanka and there's also a huge need even just in Colombo which is a very unusual city. I think from memory there's about a half a million people in it but every day about another half a million come and go, this is an unusual burden on a city to double every day the amount of people in it. There's a huge opportunity uh, within technology, as I've said, but also within uh, tourism, you know, enhancing tourism precincts to create more economic activation, more regular visiting, better environmental outcomes, less waste, less traffic. These are things that everybody, uh, almost everybody, there'll yeah. be somebody who doesn't, you know, wants want for it. their family and yeah. for their country and yeah. for their children and for the future. So there's a huge opportunity, as I said, you have the right type of people with the right types of skills here. Uh, there's been you know, a bit of a, let's say, an economic reset post COVID. Um, and you know, there's a great opportunity for Sri Lanka here today. Welcome back to the spotlight where stories ignite change. Now today we have with us uh, Mr. Corey Gray who is in our studios today. Uh, we were in a very interesting conversation. We were talking about uh, smart cities. So let's get into our next uh, topic that is also a uh, topic on the, the concept of smart. Uh, this is smart tourism, another level area of your expertise. So let's talk about the potential benefits of implementing smart tourism in Sri Lanka. So it's a, <coughs> an interesting topic that we talked about here a few years ago. Um, globally our organization is about to start a a program or a set of task forces to create understanding and the tools and educational assets and playbooks for smart tourism. Obviously Sri Lanka has a very uh, 
tourist driven economy. Yes. Um, in the areas where we're working at the moment, it's quite diverse. We've got people from Cancun in um, Mexico, where they have a big cruise ship tourism economy. Uh, city of Las Vegas, again, a very different, you know, 800,000 people a week, I think, come in and out of Las Vegas. Tomorrow I'm in the Maldives at a smart tourism conference, equally in Croatia and the Mediterranean. Um, I happen to be also a Maltese citizen as Australian, so that is an incredibly tourist driven uh, a, a economy with very different needs. So again, the general principles of the business case apply. Um, tourist destinations want to make more money, they want to reduce cost, they want to reduce risk and they want to create better experiences for their, for their guests and the staff and particularly in places like Sri Lanka and, and Maldives there's very strong obligations in terms of environmental responsibility, right? So yeah. all of these things make for what we you know, call the shared benefit. Everyone's winning. The government's winning. The, the operator of the, uh, the resort is winning. The client is winning. Staff are better off. And these so principles- So I think it's a win-win for both? Oh, for, for everybody. You know, the right. government's attracting more people, it's creating, stimulating the economy, more taxes. People are having a better experience as a tourist. Yeah. Um, the environment is benefiting from that economic activity because Thinking logically, if the Maldives is full of just ocean-flown rubbish, then they don't have an economy as a country anymore. Yeah. So that money has to be reinvested into that responsible relationship between people and place. So it's a really important function. And as I mentioned earlier, as an organisation, we, we want to be dealing in areas that can affect significant change and benefit, right? So uh, this is one that has, has high high priority as is the smart airports uh, work that we're doing in regional communities also. I think another question that some people might have in mind is when it comes to tourism in Sri Lanka it indirectly and directly it's connected to a lot of job sectors so a concern that they might have is will that job be secure when everything is converted into the smart tourism uh, sector so what do you think will the job market be secure? I think if you look historically at the way labour markets have responded to technology, so if you just look at going from horses to cars, the people who used to wash the horses and put the shoes on the horses' feet and pick up all the horse poo out of the street mm. suddenly had better jobs being mechanics servicing cars and there's a natural progression to typically better and higher paid jobs and it's logical if for example, we could double the tourism industry in Sri Lanka. There's a lot of opportunities, even for some of the more less skilled, let's say, and potentially yeah. lower paid jobs. So typically um, the, the progress of technology means some jobs definitely will, will cease, but new, different, and typically um, higher paid uh, jobs come to, to take their place. And the thing of tourism in particular though is there's always that human touch to it. There's some things that just can't, you can't replace with that service experience. And they've tried in Las Vegas having robots serve you dinner and all of this, and people don't don't respond to that. They want to, they want to do and have that. We are humans at the end of the day. We're yeah. not. It's not our objective to become machines. machines. I hope. So it creates more of those types of person-to-person -person jobs, and it creates better. Um, let's say machine to human jobs and opportunities uh, and you know Sri Lanka is a very cultural diverse country and we are from you know about centuries centuries of you know rich history how do you think uh, smart tourism will contribute in preserving our cultural heritage and you know the conservation of its ecosystems that's another a really good one the, the beauty of having all of this data or data, depending which country you're in, uh, at your disposal now. We're talking about creating, in some of the other areas where I'm working, curated tourism experiences. Okay. So if you go to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and if you're a 19 year old backpacker, you probably want to stay somewhere quite cheap, eat somewhere quite cheap, go surfing, go out late. If you're a retired surgeon and with your partner, yeah. You probably want to stay in a different place and more interested in nature and animals and restaurants. So you can start to have a far more curated experience, experience. And, you can, 
And then that speaks to issues of cultural heritage and significance. Um, just a few days ago, believe it or not, um, with our team starting up in Ukraine, there's a huge uh, religious history, particularly for Jewish people in the Ukraine, that they want to be able to create the data sets that people can go and have a post-war tourism experience and a okay. cultural experience of mm. such a nature. Or if you're Muslim and you're on Hajj, or if you're... So there's different experiences that you can have uh, and it makes more better accessibility to the experience you want to have, many of which can be those more deep cultural and historic uh, experiences. In Australia, people want to know about Indigenous culture, but they also want to know about European culture. So yeah. you can look at one or all or both or neither, oh, yeah. depending <laughs> depending on, on what experience you want. So it actually makes for a better, a better experience for the hosts as well as the visitors. So how do you think uh, smart tourism solutions uh, can help Sri Lanka in addressing challenges uh, such as overpopulation in uh, or overcrowding I would say in popular tourist destinations, infrastructure optimization and you know maybe sustainable development? Th there's the really linear things which is just being more efficient with electricity, more efficient with water, okay. more efficient with waste, the really the basic level things. If you, I mean traffic here isn't the worst in the world, probably Dakar and is, is worse than a few other places, but 60% of traffic is people either delivering things and picking them up or looking for a park or leaving a park. So the second that you can have intelligent solutions to make people, uh, enable people to do those things more efficiently, you immediately take a lot of stress off the infrastructure and, and off, of, off of resources. Um, and again, if you can make waste, for example, occupy one-tenth of the space, that means 90% fewer trucks coming and going with rubbish in them, less landfill. So there's, there's those really obvious um, um, ways to make a significant impact. And then there's a part about urban design and urban planning that the data can allow you then to understand about where people are, where they need to be, that these general assumptions that are made by architects and urban planners and traffic engineers typically can now be validated. So you get a lot better planning process, which means that over time you have a much more efficient and better designed community. Okay, so heading into the smart uh, tourism sector, I think it will also be a good start for entrepreneurs, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, one of the things about smart tourism and, and airports is a lot of these um, <coughs> resorts are owned by private enterprise. As yeah. I mentioned earlier, some of the challenges with government can be how it organises itself, how it procures. Um, but with the private sector, if they can save money, reduce risk, make money and give a better customer and staff experience, then you find that that economic stimulation happens a lot quicker. Um, and the ability to adopt entrepreneurial and innovative solutions is, um, uh, the uptake is, is faster. So. I examples, I think I spend 200 days a year in hotels, right? And yeah. anyone who looks at my hotel profile will know I don't drink beer <laughs> in my minibar, but I do drink wine, right? Okay. And that I have an air conditioner set at 20, not 23, and I like the water at this temperature, not that temperature. So Customize. there's all sorts of things you can mm. do to customise uh, that experience. Um, and people remember that, you know, if you leave your room two days ago, um, I'm in Dublin and then I thought I was going back to my room but then I wasn't and then I wanted my room to be made up. You can hit a button and change it from do not disturb to please make up my room even though I'm on the way to a meeting, right? So there's all these things that you can do to create a better experience. That makes more efficiency for the cleaning staff because they've got a, a clear workflow. They're not relying on little tags hanging on doors and all of these things. So there's a lot that can be done to provide really significant benefits to everybody. That's right. Now, Cor, before we started the interview, I think I mentioned to you that uh, unfortunately you're here on a short visit and uh, you wouldn't have much time to meet uh, a few of, you know, you know, visitors and the public. So I managed to get in a question that a few of our viewers had for you. So one interesting question uh, that, uh, I, you know, popped up was, uh, this question is for you, Corey. So what innovative approaches can we take as a country to provide inclusive and accessible smart tourism 
welcome experiences for visitors or tourists with uh, disabilities, ensuring that everyone can fully enjoy the country's cultural and natural attractions. Yeah. That's another really good question and it's an area that we work on, there's, and there's, there's two parts of it. One is mobility and accessibility, the other one is what we call digital equity. Uh, we saw, and I, I'm, I'll come back to the point, but after COVID, um, people started to go back to concerts and sporting events and so on, but many of them became zero touch entry. So you had to have a scanner phone, mm. not have a paper ticket. Yes. What we saw in Australia was many elderly people couldn't go and watch their cricket team anymore or their football team because they don't use devices to get QR codes and purchase online. Um, equally, the technologies that I mentioned earlier um, in the hotel room, um, if you're a mobility impaired person, there are a lot of different things that you could do to automatically set water temperatures in your shower, on or off. Um, there's a huge amount of, of um, um, flexibility around mobility that we can create with different technologies and by uh, uh, understanding data. And I think I went back to a, you know, our, our organization's mission and part of that is to be equitable and inclusive, right? And so we have a very strong focus on uh, digital equity and aged care in, in these task forces that we put together and how we can go about uh, doing that. There are, there are some natural physical constraints as we know, if there's no footpaths or sidewalks, it's very difficult. I wouldn't want to be getting um, pushed in a wheelchair down the, the main road outside mm. the, you know, the, the port down there. So uh, there, there's a responsibility in urban design, um, but we're also seeing a big change in the nature of mobility to connected vehicles. Uh, our smart airports task force is looking at vertiports so people can arrive at an airport and go into an electric drone and literally be delivered to a place that you couldn't be delivered normally. But the beauty of that is that, it, you know, that real estate on the road suddenly becomes clearer and we've got new opportunities. So the change of how we use urban space and, and definitely a focus on equity and inclusion um, is front of mind. The physical aspects are, are more complex, but we have a lot of different technologies that can support a better experience for, uh, for um, mobility or otherwise um, impaired people or just if you think about again growing tourism there's a natural point where people get to 80 or 85 and don't go on that holiday to Europe anymore because it's it's just too hard to get through an airport it's exhausting so we're looking very closely at, at ways to do that. So this is uh, something a little different another uh, the port city in Colombo is a brand new uh, new city development that was built as an extension uh, of the central business district of Sri Lanka's uh, vibrant commercial capital Colombo. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about this, Corey. What do you think? Uh, what I've seen, I mean, the project's been going for a while. I've seen iterations of it over the last five, maybe even uh, a few more years. I think the, the, the first part Again, we'll come back to the urban planning and design and how it's funded. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to take Colombo and, you know, by default, the country almost very far forward, but that means getting the economic model for that right. Um, there have been some projects here and in other places where those economic models perhaps have not been right and that financial benefit is going to other countries or other, other organisations. So, Having a sustainable financial model, having really strong transparency in how that, that precinct is structured economically is fundamental. There are, there's a huge opportunity because it's effectively a greenfield area. area. It, there's not the challenges of legacy that you see in some places. Um, by way of example, our organisation is working with another Washington-based organisation, Charter Cities Institute, to help build a framework for 38 greenfield cities in Africa. Now that is so much easier to work on than trying to solve for Istanbul with 18 million people and 100,000 buildings that will collapse in a mild earthquake, right? It's just so much easier. So there's a great opportunity to work efficiently and deliver something that is uh, fit for purpose now, future-proof, delivers all of those basic things like electrical efficiency, waste management efficiency, water efficiency, ease of mobility where people don't need 
uh, cars all the time to get around where they call it the 15 minute city but that you can walk and reach anything you need to from a hospital to a school to a to a shop to whatever without a car which is the, the fundamental principle of that the neon project that the Saudis are building right so the right urban design will capture all of that and provide exponential benefits suddenly there'll be a place without 10 million tuk-tuks honking at each other every time you try and cross the road right um, and the other thing is getting um, homogeneity in there in terms of representation of different industry sectors so healthcare um, fintech um, education uh, retail tourism co uh, commercial operations getting that balance right which again is the the challenge of the you know the, the planners and the urban designers uh, can see an incredibly valuable asset that could you know lead the region if it's executed properly in terms of experience not only for tourists but remember the locals have got to have a better life here Sri Lankans are in, are in this uh, more than the tourists are uh, so it's got to work both ways and you don't want to end up with an economy say like Italy or Spain where in Barcelona was there a few weeks ago no one wants tourism anymore yeah. you know they've just had enough of tourism so they want their houses back and they want their cafes back and and they've had enough so getting that balance right between the economic benefit and the tourism and cultural experience and, and improving the lives of, of the local communities got to be front of mind. Welcome back to the spotlight. Now, I do not want to take any more time because we are in a very interesting and informative discussion. So let me ask you, Corey, we are heading into another interesting topic and an, you know, an area of expertise for you as well, smart airports. Let me ask you again, a traditional airport and a smart airport, what is the difference? <laughs> At the moment, nothing. but. Um it, it's on that sim a similar topic. It, airports necessarily have a lot of different systems. They need to keep people safe. They need to process people's information in relation to the airline, in relation to the airport, in relation to their government if they're travelling internationally. And so the, the, there's an organisation, Airports Council International, that I think represents nearly 2,000 of the bigger airports around the world. And they started working with another industry group, TM Forum, and now Digital Twin Consortium and together we're looking at what is a standardised, data-driven, technology-enabled airport look like, a good one. What, what are the reasons to do that? Firstly, if you travel much, you'll see every airport's different. You know, yesterday you get to Istanbul Airport, you clear security, then you check in, then you clear immigration, then you clear security again. In Singapore, you just go through and do, do it all at once. Um, in Colombo it's negotiable, it, ch it changes day by day, but that's not true. Um, but everything's different and they've realised that if they can get people out of queues for baggage drop, ticketing, security, boarding and into shops and cafes and restaurants, again the economic activation piece is there. So uh, the airports are making more money, passengers are having a better experience, um, you can get efficiencies in terms of workflow. Uh, you know, there's challenges. When I got to LAX the other day, all the planes from Asia landed about the same time. So immigration has thousands and thousands of people in it. But they don't want to put on too many people and process them all in 10 minutes because that's not economically viable for the airport. So they make it take hours for yeah. these people to yeah. get through. So the question is, how do we optimise the economic benefit and the user experience? And then how do we share information that um, you know, you don't have to give your data once at the ticketing desk and then once at customs and then another time when you, yeah. you know, all of that process. Yeah, how, how making do we, the passenger wet. How do we make that passenger experience better yeah. and at the same time, how do we maintain our airport more efficiently? There's big objectives on net zero carbon emissions around the aviation industry, right? So um, that comes right down to if you can reduce maintenance cycles on fire systems, for example by having automated reporting. That means someone's not driving in a car, parking their car, creating 
carbon emissions, getting in the way of the passengers, testing things. Um, so there's a cost benefit there, there's also that environmental benefit. <clears throat> and then the other thing is just finding the use patterns. So there's a trial been running in Heathrow Airport where you can use a, what's called a digital twin, which is a, a living model of, a virtual model of, of a real world asset that's drawing data from all different sources and you can quickly see where and how people move in an airport. Uh, so as important as it is to know where they are in a cafe or a restaurant or which toilets are getting used a lot and which ones aren't, there's all these other areas where people never go. But an architect's designed it, the client's paid to build it, they pay yeah. to clean it, no one uses it. No one uses so it. you can start to gather all of that information to in inform renovations and upgrades of an airport to inform the design of new airports. Um, and also all these things about passenger load, waste management, energy consumption, servicing, passenger movement, all of these things can be made more efficient and coming back to those, those guiding principles of standardisation, economic activation, cost reduction, risk reduction, every passenger wants to be safer in an airport. So if you can have analytics that can track unusual or at risk behaviour of people then I think we probably all would like that. Uh, but we don't want to give our privacy up. So there's this balance that we talked about before. But, you know, it's great to see the airlines uh, working together. There's a huge amount at stake. You know, there's, there's 19,000 airports just in the USA. So it's a huge part of the economy. And then the relationship of airports to cities is, is fundamental as we see here, you have an airport that's a bit further away, but you know, the economies of both and the interfacing between them is, is a really critically important. So again, getting more information about that uh, helps a lot. And also if airports are more seamless, you know, I've seven kids because I've been incredibly careless in my life. But when we go on a holiday with seven kids, you want it, you don't want it to be too difficult, no, right? It's, and there's times where we just say, we're not gonna go because it's too hard. But if you know that airport experience is gonna be easier and you can be in and out and it's quick, then you might make the decision to travel rather than not travel. So. Um, yeah, there's huge opportunities, as we said again, in terms of cost uh, reduction, economic activation, environmental and, and people benefit, and it's an exciting project to be working on and we'll be releasing at T TM Forum's main event in Copenhagen, I think on 17th of September, the first outputs of, of this for 2023. Okay, now, Corey, it is a pity that, you know, you can't have a one-on-one -on -one session with the public, but I made it an active effort to make them uh, connected so that they have an opportunity to connect uh, via the program. Uh, so another question from the public for you is uh, this. What are the economic implications and potential return on investment for airports that embrace a smart airport concept? Um. The, the, the sort of numbers we're looking at are probably a, an up to 40-50% increased revenue okay, um, and cost reductions that could be in a similar order of magnitude. So they're profound. Uh, you can look at you know, energy reductions in the order of 20%, water and waste reductions up to, in some cases, even 90%. Um, the, the, the benefits are huge. Yeah. And so the trick is with airports that we already have, you don't just shut an airport down for a year and upgrade it. So with um, what we would call brownfield airports, you've got to find a path to the future that it manages legacy systems and processes effectively. And mm. that's part of what we're developing as an organisation, those, those playbooks. So you'll be able to have a piece of software that we call, you know, Smart Cities Activator, and you'll be able to enter in, am I government owned or private sector owned? Am I domestic, international or both? Am I a hub airport or a spoke airport? Layer in your organisation structure. If you don't have a CTO, do you want to train somebody? Link through, here's the training organisations you could use, here's a tender document. Do you want to recruit somebody? Here's five recruitment firms with, do you want to contract the service from a consultant? So we're, we're making tools to allow the process of moving from whatever level of maturity that you have as an airport to the best state you can be as efficiently as possible. Uh, different funding models that uh, organisations can choose based on their jurisdiction and their level of size and the level of capital they might have. So um, 
you know, what baggaging systems do you have, what ticketing systems, what types of planes, what airlines, mm. um, all of these things can feed quickly to create a model that has a clear path towards maturity. All right, Corey, now time is ticking. I have many questions uh, for you, but unfortunately, our time has come to an end. But in a few words, do you mind giving a take home message to all of you as watching us right now? Um, I would suggest that um, the smart cities or the smart communities movement, let's call it intelligent communities, uh, has a unique amount of benefit that, that can offer citizens and we have a chance now to, as I said the other day, take a step forward at a pace that we haven't been able to do for many, many years. And we do need to get the, the frameworks right about governance, we do need to get the procurement right, but the benefits for all citizens are, are significant and, and now is the time for us to, to work together on that opportunity. All right, so that being said, it is time to conclude our program for today. Uh, we were in conversation with Mr. Corey Gray, Global CEO of Smart Cities Council, the world's largest and longest running Smart Cities social impact organization, and founder and director of global technology solutions provider LVX Global. Thank you for being with us in our studio, and we at ITN want to wish you all the very best for your journey ahead. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, with that, we come to the end and we and I kindly invite all of you to join us again next Monday for the Spotlight where stories ignite change on Vasandhan TV and the official YouTube channel of Prime Television at 9pm. Have a lovely evening and stay safe.